Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I know that um, you have always granted a little leeway to respond to um, the occasional statement that's made across the floor. And perhaps I will start off by responding to one such statement that I had the opportunity to, to, to hear. I was hoping that I might have been in a position to congratulate the member for Sufre Fossil by saying to him, looks like he got promoted to the front benches given how he started off his delivery yesterday. But of course, after some reflection, I've decided that um, I will have to withdraw that interest. <laughs> and, and, I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why, Mr. Speaker. You see, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> he indicated to the House that this government will be introducing a budgetary policy statement later on in the course of the year. And then he alluded to the fact that the previous administration did not be fit to. I, I know you remember, Mr. Speaker, because I'm sure it resonated with you. I did not see fit to introduce a budget policy statement. And of course, he explained that by lack of courage, lack of confidence, and, and so on. Now, I've heard that from, from the floor of this house on several occasions, and it's useful to give history an alternative view in these matters, because I suspect down the road our students of history would want to look at the legislative history of this parliament, our hands had, and see how issues were dealt with. And I think some of us need to realize sometimes we are actually speaking to history. Now, the truth is, and those colleagues of mine who were present in Cabot will know, that the reason why we never had a budget policy statement in 2016 was actually very simple, that I felt very strongly, and I told them, that an election was imminent. It was an election year, and it was unfair to an incumbent government or an incoming government, rather, um, to find a budget policy statement crafted on estimates of expenditure. And we should allow the electorate to make the decision. And when they make the decision, then the new government will have the option of introducing a budget policy statement, as they had that option if they wanted to exercise it. I, there is always a supplementary budget. And I dared a member for Sufre Francis Jack to tell me anywhere in the Constitution it is written that it is a requirement of the appropriation bill that you have a budget policy statement. The Constitution makes absolutely no reference. It's not a requirement of the Constitution. It's a convention, it's a practice endorsed by our standing orders, yes. But then I just want to tell the honorable member that the omens are not good. And let me explain what I mean. <laughs> the omens are not good. First, governments that introduce a budget just before the election, they always lose. Always lose, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, they always lose if they introduce a budget before elections. Now, the second thing is, um, Mr. Speaker, I think this is an odd year. We, this is what, 2021? And you don't do well in odd years. You lost an election in 1997. You lost an election in 2011. The die is cast. You will lose this year because it is 2021. So you're in serious trouble. And the omens are not very good at all. So you might want to and I noticed a member for Gaspar Southeast is watching me intently on these observations and these points. Now let me turn, Mr. Speaker, to the meat of the issue. Mr. Speaker, if there is anything that these estimates of revenue and expenditure reveal, it is, as I have attempted to say in the past, that our country is in a deep hole. And just consider for a moment the indicators, Mr. Speaker. We are unable to get any authoritative clarification of our debt to GDP ratio. 
A CDB publication, Regional Report 2020 Review and 2021 Outlook, puts it at 102%, which is what the leader of the opposition was in effect saying yesterday, but he didn't quote the source. Yesterday morning, the Minister of Finance rose to his feet and says, that is false. It's 87%. And let's wait until the Economic and Social Review indicate what the amount is, but we shall wait. Speaker, on a point of order, just to help the member from uh, Beaufort South, we do have the document from CDB giving the correction. Be happy to make a document to the House. Sure, There'll sure. Be, hopefully, he will take yeah, my word sure, for it. Sure, sure. The, but to, the debt to GDP is 86 percent. Sure, and you will notice that I did not prevent you from interrupting me because that's not a point of order. But yeah. I, I still allowed. So, Mr. Speaker, let's move on. Continue. Right. See how generous I am to them, Mr. Speaker. Whatever the number, whether it is 87 or 102 percent, Mr. Speaker, it is clear that the unparalleled borrowing by this administration has placed substantial upward pressure on this ratio. I also recall, Mr. Speaker, that the Minister of Finance also suggested in a previous sitting in this House that the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I was about to say, Mr. Speaker, before I come to that, the decline in our GDP is so drastic that it is unknown at this time, the precise quantum of the decline. At one sitting, we were told by the Minister of Finance that GDP had declined by an estimated 18%, and I'm sure honorable members will confirm they remember this. I also recalled that the Minister of Finance also suggested in a previous sitting in this House that the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank had estimated that GDP had declined even further, possibly, and these were his cautionary words, by some 22%. So we have this figure fluctuating between 18 and 22%. The problem, Mr. Speaker, and it's rather strange that the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank website does not cite the figure even at this time. Possibly it is that St. Lucia has not provided the data to ECCB because they base their information on the data presented by the subject country. But on available GDP estimates apart, we have seen a dramatic downturn in revenue. And Mr. Speaker, let me just say that if any country suffers a GDP decline of 15, 16, 17, 18 percent, worse yet 22 percent, 27 percent, it is a veritable disaster. It's a monumental disaster, Mr. Speaker. And in recent times in economic history, there are two countries I know that have suffered disasters of that kind where GDP has plummeted. One was Grenada, when it had that major hurricane. I think they declined to about 18 and 19 percent, and another, of course, Dominica, but Dominica recuperated because of the heavy expenditure in infrastructure. But on available GDP estimates apart, we have seen a dramatic downturn in revenue, and no one contests that. The figures say that. This downturn has been followed by record levels of borrowing, unprecedented, Mr. Speaker. Inevitably, we have a rising overall deficit on our hands, suggested by these estimates to be in the region of 7.9%. And whether that is absolutely accurate is still debatable. And none of us sitting on this chamber could ever forget what it was like when we had a deficit bordering on 10% of GDP and all other factors were normal and we had to deal with that, including, of course, creating and introducing measures to engage in some structural adjustment in the economy. And whether or not we care to admit it, unemployment has sharply increased 
deepening poverty has occurred amidst obvious signs of social dysfunction and decay. And all of us in this house will have a huge task to pull this country together and pull the people together to deal with the social deviance that has occurred, particularly through this pandemic. And I have seen evidence of honorable members attempting to deal with it, either by way of condemning what has occurred, others um, by offering counseling, but we are slowly moving to a society that is dysfunctional and increasingly unwilling and unwilling rather to cooperate with the authority of the day to deal with issues. This pandemic has worsened that possibility. And of course, the painful one, our handling of the COVID pandemic has been dismal. We now have to concede that. And we know it's the worst in the Eastern Caribbean. The question is, how did this happen? Where did it go wrong? Mr. Speaker, I'm tired, to be frank, of investigations. And uh, there's a point at which investigation and more investigation has a limited use. But I'll say this. Whatever has occurred with the handling of the pandemic, we need to, as a country, analyze it, assess it, because the future still holds possibilities in pandemics and need to correct the structural deformities that have led to the situation we are currently in. No doubt, Mr. Speaker, some of the problems are historical, some are not. How we exercise policy options is an issue. How prepared we were is an issue. How, um, how is it that we handle the equipment, procurement, etc., is an issue. So, Mr. Speaker, I am hoping that a dispassionate assessment will be done to evaluate our performance and uh, to ensure that we do not repeat the mistakes that we have made in the past few months. I will, as I have done before, Mr. Speaker, in this House, concede this. This is an unprecedented crisis of extraordinary magnitude and proportion never experienced since our independence in 1979. And this applies to whichever government would have been in office, and none of us can pretend otherwise. But there is a responsibility. To my mind, Mr. Speaker, these estimates of revenue and expenditure should indicate to us, to the people of St. Lucia, even to the F, F and Fs, how precisely we are going to crawl out from the deep hole in which we have found ourselves. I concede to a monumental burden has been cast on the government. The question is whether the government has discharged the burden imposed on it by these estimates of revenue and expenditure as presented to the House. That is the issue. Has these estimates of revenue and expenditure showed us a clear path out of the morass in which we find ourselves? Are the estimates of revenue and expenditures presented crafted to resolve the fundamental economic and financial problems which we face now and in the future? That is the issue. And this is what this debate should be about. Who has the most realistic plan to rescue the people of St. Lucia from the hole in which they have been cast? That's what this debate is about. It's not just a policy debate. It's the story behind the figures, what the figures say. Is there a clear path? There is no plan from the Minister of Finance to relieve our woes, no path to recovery, no restoration of hope and confidence. The only plan on the table has come from the leader of the opposition. Why do I say this? Mrs. Well, you know, you came to the table screaming belatedly 
but yet you had to take his advice on dealing with the COVID pandemic before you. But we are leave that for the time being. Mr. Speaker, when I examine the proposed estimates of revenue and expenditure, I see nothing which suggests to be operating in a crisis. It's multiple crises, not just one, multiple. We are in the midst of a pandemic that has caused a loss of jobs, claimed 55 lives, not just 55, but 55 lives, closed businesses, caused a near collapse of our healthcare system, unleash incredible hardship and suffering. Yet what do we see in the estimates of revenue and expenditure? More of the same. A bloated capital program, increasing debt, reduced expenditure on transfers, unnecessary expenditure on pet projects of no immediate value to the people of St. Lucia, projects that will have no discernible impact on the quality of life of our people. Let us, Mr. Speaker, examine some aspects of this budget in some detail. And I'm going to nitpick, Mr. Speaker, um, because I don't see the coherence that requires a particular kind of approach. Let me first turn to a point made by the leader of the opposition. It deserves repetition. The budget summary, Mr. Speaker, and you can look at it, suggests that recurrent revenue for 2021-22 will be in the ballpark of EC1 billion relative to an outturn of 883 million in 2020-21. We all know that what the effects of the policies of this UWP administration have been, and they are accentuated by the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. I am therefore curious about the capacity of the economy to yield an additional $118 million in 21-22, while global and regional economies are still reeling from the effects of the pandemic. The question is this, where is this additional revenue coming from? What is its source? According to the budget summary, in 2021, the government of St. Lucia had programmed some 10.8 million in capital revenue for financial year 2020-21, but realized just about $374,000. For 2021-2022, I noticed that amount of EC 6.04 million has been programmed. It would be interesting for the Minister of Finance to disclose the nature of this revenue and the circumstances that suggest this amount would be realized in 2021-22 relative to the outturn in 2020-21. Mr. Speaker, when one looks at revenue performance over the past year, nearly every head of recurrent revenue has shown a reduction in revenue generation. Just, just take a look, Mr. Speaker, if you like, at pages eight, pages eight to ten, and you'll see, you'll see what I'm, 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 I'm getting at. So. Well, let's take, Mr. Speaker, page eight with inland revenue. In 2019 to 20, it was 500 million. The approved estimates in 2021 suggested it is 438 million 142, but in actuality it was 374 million 543, and it is now climbing, according to these draft estimates, to 426 million 214,000. Go to Customs and Excise. They handle VAT, etc., airport tax, excise taxes, etc. 2019-2020, Approved estimates 2020-21, 484,991,000. Revised estimates 2020-21, $426,294,000. And of course, it continues, Mr. Speaker. 
And if, Mr. Speaker, you want to, to, to go through the rest, it is entirely up to you because I think the point, the point, has, been, the point has been made um, with these two major agencies. Yet, Mr. Speaker, total revenue and grants have been estimated at $1.1 billion, approximately $7 million less than the approved estimates for 2020-21, and over $200 million more than the budgeted outturn for 2020-21. And again, Mr. Speaker, you are invited to look at the budget summary. Further, Mr. Speaker, Tax revenue is forecasted to be 107 million higher than the revised estimates for 2020-21. The government has forecasted increases in pro property tax. Apparently, the party is over with the giveaway of the last three years. I think probably is coming to an end. Goods and services and international trade in financial year 2021-22. Clearly, Mr. Speaker. This suggests a return to some revenue sources, but, it in, but in a highly buoyant economy. Is this for real? Are we dealing with a real economy? Are we dealing with a real country? Mr. Speaker, I would want the Minister of Finance to explain the assumptions and factors that contribute to this optimistic forecast. Is revenue deliberately over-forecasted to demonstrate a smaller projected deficit for 2021-22. And this is one of the simplest tricks in the book. What you do to deal with your projected deficit, you inflate your um, revenue figures deliberately. You over forecast. Is this intended to lure St. Lucians into a false sense of security? So that they feel that their government is managing the fiscal affairs of the country prudently. Mr. Speaker, this is not a time for games. This, this thing is serious. It's a time for truth, and it is a time to bring the people of the country into your confidence so that they know what they face. Mr. Speaker, I ask these questions because discerning St. Lucians would know that it is only after the end of a financial year, for example, January to December 2020, businesses would declare their income and pay corporate tax. If we therefore agree that the economy contracted severely in 2020, then it means that many businesses would have suffered losses in 2020. How then would government revenue increase in such an environment? Similarly, Mr. Speaker, many persons have lost jobs during the pandemic. Recovery in the job market will likely to be slow, given the uncertainty globally. Of course, everybody's expecting a huge rebound in tourism because of the pent up frustration and disappointment and anger that they haven't had. Um, sun and, and, and sea and sun. But of course, that depends on how things unfold. It is well known that govern, government revenue thrives in periods of high consumption induced by high disposable income. And whether salaries are not necessarily the best and they're not high, but numbers matter. How can we therefore assume that consumption will increase? And so too will government revenue under those circumstances. Mr. Speaker, I'm still on the budget summary. And I want to draw your attention to the issue of wages and salaries. I notice wages and salaries are programmed to increase by approximately $9 million over the budgeted amount for 2020-2021. Why is this increase? I'm curious. Will this be expended on the recruitment of new staff to the public service? Who are they? Or will we be recruiting more doctors and nurses to deal with the crisis in healthcare associated with the explosion in the number of COVID-19 infections on Ireland? And I want to indicate, Mr. Speaker, if you see that was a case, 
that this nine, ten million dollars would be spent on recruiting more nurses to look after the people of St. Lucia, I don't think any one of us would have ever had a quarrel because we know the immense pressure and strain that our healthcare practitioners have had to bear. So explanation is in the order. But I want to turn, Mr. Speaker, to an item called transfers, Mr. Speaker. Again, in a budget summary. Of concern, Mr. Speaker, is that transfers are budgeted to be some $40 million lower than the expected outturn for 2020-21. Again, I draw your attention to the budget summary. Mr. Speaker, you may not be aware, but that budget line transfers typically includes amounts allocated to statutory enterprises or bodies that provide utilities or social services to the population. In an environment where we are witnessing so much suffering, pain, and distress, why in a period when the budget is increasing are the transfers to ordinary citizens declining? Why, Mr. Speaker? Why are we taking measures like this at, at this point when people are crying out for support? Why? I mean, Mr. Speaker, it does, it does not even stop there. It's this gnawing insensitivity that is so troublesome. Take, Mr. Speaker, you may think I'm exaggerating, but take this issue of tax refunds. I understand the pressure civil servants are under in drafting a budget, and it is my understanding that this is the first time when Esther Young was, re was not available to draft the budget. This was done by the public officers, who, of course, should be complimented. Maybe we'll get clarification in due course. Mr. Speaker, I note with alarm the one million reduction in the allocation for tax refunds over the amount budgeted in 2020-2021. Even more alarming is the fact that out of the 10.5 million budgeted for tax refunds in 2020-2021, only 7.6 million was expended. In other words, Mr. Speaker, in their time of greatest need when lives and livelihoods were being lost, the UWP administration prioritized expenditure on roads, rather than provide relief to St. Lucians in the form of refunds which are legally due to them. This is a time when citizens need money in their, in their hands, in their pockets. This is a time to put some of the promised ching ching in the pockets of working St. Lucians, not deprive them of what they're justly entitled. The more money that is in circulation, the more people have disposable income, the better it is for all of us and for the economy. I am still on the budget summary, Mr. Speaker, and I continue to focus on it. The budget summary suggests that the government of St. Lucia borrowed approximately $618 million to finance last year's budget. And I invite you to see the projected outturn for 2020-2021. And hopes to borrow another $509 million more in the financial year 2021-2022. Now, Mr. Speaker, as a former Minister of Finance, <laughs> one for whom all kinds of criticisms have been offered, I certainly understand the difficulties associated with deteriorating economic conditions and lower revenue performance. However, one especially important question emerges. In acquiring 618 million in debt, how much relief was provided to the ordinary solution during this period of crisis? Can the government say how much of that debt actually touched people's lives? How much of that debt went and benefit people individually? How much employment was created? How did the average single mother or student benefit? How can St. Lucians be expected to repay this debt when they were not the beneficiaries of the same? Mr. Speaker, I sure hope that the Honorable Minister for Finance can provide some measure of accountability on the matter of debt and its intergenerational burden. 
Let's tell the people the truth. Regarding the debt, the administration should also speak to the expectations on how they plan to raise a further $509 million in 2021-22, following $618 million in 2020-2021. Who are we marketing these Treasury bills and bonds to, Mr. Speaker? Who are they? Who are the bads? Approximately $1.1 billion is expected to be borrowed in two years. How will the market perceive this? And Mr. Speaker, this is a matter I have continuously raised. But let me leave that for a moment and turn to the UWP administration favorite line item in the budget, capital expenditure. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic rages on. Over 4,000 St. Lucians have been confirmed as positive with COVID-19 infections. 55 persons have died with or of COVID-19 infections, yet the government marches to the beat of the pre-pandemic drum, concrete and steel economics. We surface roads, build drains, a la direct awards. But there is some inconsistency in the figures for capital expenditure that requires some clarification. On page Roman numeral three, capital expenditure is estimated at 278 million. However, on page Roman numeral four, Mr. Speaker, capital expenditure is ex expressed at 404 million. Whatever the amount, it is not surprising that such a significant sum has been allocated for capital expenditure while St. Lucians suffer job and income loss. No surprise here. We all know what time it is. Yet the intensity of this government to the plight of the average St. Lucian citizen still baffles me. Any relief that is available seems to have been left to the private sector. And there are some institutions that stand out and the public at large need to recognize their contribution. I must say the Bank of St. Lucia is one such, one such institution. Lucilec has shown commendable um, patience in dealing with bills. You can't say the same thing for the other utilities. I believe First National has attempted to provide some measure of, of, of support. But the other institutions do not, do not. They're on your back, they phone you, they harass you for all kinds of reasons. Loads are being called in left, right, and center. That can't be right, Mr. Speaker, and there's no voice to be heard. But we return to the summary, Mr. Speaker. According to the budget summary, the government has budgeted an overall deficit of 7.9% of GDP, or 383 million. The difference between revenue and expenditure for 2021-22 is $630 million. Yet the Minister of Finance comes to this parliament and makes statements about fiscal prudence and sinking fund, etc. If a government is running a deficit, Mr. Speaker, of 7.9% of GDP, assuming that figure is correct, and you propose to borrow $509 million to finance the deficit, how can this government put aside any money in a sinking fund in that kind of circumstance? You're borrowing for a sinking fund? Are these... Cons are these Concepts bandied about in anticipation that average St. Lucians do not understand the fiscal operations of the country? Is the intention to cause more confusion? These statements, Mr. Speaker, reflect the high level of policy dissonance exhibited by this government during the last five years. With respect to financing the budget, Mr. Speaker, I noticed the amount of $79.6 million from the World Bank for the financial year 2021-22. I believe this is the amount, am I correct, that was the subject of the other debate in this parliament a few weeks ago. The amount is associated with a development policy credit. Typically, Mr. Speaker, 
Such loans are advanced to governments on condition that they implement key policy reforms and prior actions intended to support the development of the country. Further, these resources are usually advanced to the country on condition they maintain appropriate macroeconomic performance as monitored by the IMF and the funds can be utilized as deemed appropriate by the country. But I'm not satisfied with the explanation that emerged during the debate in this house. And I now seek clarification. A few questions emerge from this, from this. Exactly what policy measures were agreed to on behalf of the people of St. Lucia? Does the current administration have the ability or capacity to implement those measures? to allow this country to draw down on these resources? Will ordinary St. Lucians benefit from these resources even though they may feel the pain of reform measures that are likely to be implemented? Why have all these resources been allocated to capital expenditure when some could have been used to ease the suffering of ordinary St. Lucians? Speaker, I await the answers to these questions. St. Lucians need the truth. They need to know what they face when they wake up the next morning after the general elections in early May. We need to tell them. But allow me, Mr. Speaker, to turn to a few mundane agency details and departmental issues for which clarification is sought. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I said today I will nitpick. Mr. Speaker, I am at page 75 of the, of the estimates. And this is a small one, Mr. Speaker. I'm at the office of the Prime Minister, and I'm looking at a national apprenticeship program, famously called NAP. Project's expenditure has been reduced by approximately, Mr. Speaker, you will notice 1.2 million. Now, this, was, this is interesting, Mr. Speaker. This was one of the government's pet projects to provide income to its acolytes. In this environment, why has the staffing associated with the project reduced from 31 to 27 persons? And if you turn now to the Department of Health, Mr. Speaker, the agency summary for the Ministry of Health provides details on staffing. Despite the increased expenditure for financial year 2021-22, it appears there is no proposal for increasing staffing, be it temporary or permanent. Despite the ongoing pandemic and surge in cases in St. Lucia, it does not appear that relief is on its way for the tired and stretched healthcare workers of the country. Turn to page 558, Mr. Speaker, and an hour only allows you to nitpick, Mr. Speaker. And I want you to turn to ex page 558. What exactly is the role of the performance management and delivery unit? Do we need continued expenditure of $1.26 million in 2021, 2022, in a period of multiple crises? What are you doing spending a million dollars on this? What are they tasked with delivering? What is their progress to date? What have they delivered to merit their continued existence? How have they touched the lives of the people of St. Lucia and made a difference? Mr. Speaker, let's go, let me turn briefly to the Department of Home Affairs for the time being. It seems as if this, is, this department will specialize in the procurement of systems during the financial year 2021-2022. At page 567, at page 567, I see allocations for passport issuing system and the purchase of border management system at a cost of 2.9 million. Do we need this expenditure at this time? 
Should we not be redirecting our resources to saving lives, easing the distress of our citizens? I know too, Mr. Speaker, repairs to police stations inclusive of the plant machinery and equipment is estimated to cost $2.31 million. Good pages 566 to 567. For my part, Mr. Speaker, I wish to know how much of this allocation will go to the repair of the Fort Police Station at Beanfield. It baffles me, Mr. Speaker, how a relatively new building could have been abandoned and left unrepaired for almost three years. I'll let you, hey, you never be this guy who used to live in Silvestre, you know. I was wrong, right, Mr. Speaker. You never believe that the honorable member used to live in St. Lucia, but be that as me. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to turn to my good friend, the Minister of Economic Development and a member for Castries Southeast. Mr. Speaker, I have a special question. First of all, I start off with a special question for the member for Castries Southeast. Can he apprise this honorable house of the number of houses constructed and delivered to the people of St. Lucia by the Department of Housing under his leadership? How many houses? Because the figure seems rather unclear and we know that resources have been made available. But then we must return to one of the most important issues that will face us in the weeks ahead, the fate of St. Jude's. I recall, Mr. Speaker, that this UWP administration had promised the people of St. Lucia, specifically the people of year four, that St. Jude's Hospital would have been completed well before the end of 2020. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, the member of Scott Street Southeast in a memorable clip despite his recent claim that he has an aversion to timelines. And I suspect, apparently, he has learned his lesson after, of course, spending the last few years deriding the opposition for changing timelines on the completion of St. Jude. And to my utter astonishment in that famous statement in a recent interview, he says exactly what had been said before. You know, when timelines are announced, it's because I am advised by the consultants and those in charge of the project and so on, which is exactly what was said, but never mind. So, Mr. Speaker, despite his recent claim that he has an aversion to timelines, apparently he has learned his lesson. Once declared, he once declared on UWP platform celebrating the third anniversary of his party's accession to office sometime in June 2019. That before the end of the next financial year, quote, we will be occupying St. Jude in the new facility. Now, let me say this about the Honorable Member, Mr. Speaker. Contrary to what people think, apart from exchange, the exchanges we have in this house, he does speak to me outside, you know. Isn't that we don't talk to each other? The Member for Castries Southeast, the Parliamentary Representative. And, of course, he's my Parliamentary Rep. Um, now, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, um, I remember I had issued a statement regarding the Peter management area that had been violated by the decision to allow a certain building to go up after the member for Sufra and Forces had made certain statements. And the Honorable Member <coughs> met me outside shortly thereafter and he said to me, um, and these are his words. I know you're always right with your facts. Now, that's a remarkable concession. Um, remarkable concession. And I said, thank you. And then he says to me, but you know, you are wrong about the Peter management area because the meeting at which you said I was present, I was not there. So, I turned around and said to him, well, I apologize. And when I get an opportunity to 
indicate my apology. I will do so on today's a good day to say that I did apologize because he said to me that he was not a meeting I accepted. So, Mr. Speaker, I don't think he will have difficulty when I quote him, he says, we'll be occupying St. Jude in the new facility. Now, that financial year would have ended in 2020. It is now another financial year, 2021, and still no hospital. Honorable Member, please be advised, you have 15 minutes. Only, Mr. Speaker? Yes, sir. I have important things to do. I got an invitation from the Honorable Members to talk about the Ministry of Home Affairs. They say that I'm a, I, am, I want to talk about Herman Gil Francis. I didn't want to mention his name, but I, I want to get them, Mr. Speaker, so you must be tolerant. But let me return to an observation of the leader of the opposition. I have cautioned the member for ancillary canneries never open doors. On page 593 of the estimates of expenditure, the leader of the opposition observed that an allocation of EC $12.8 million was made for the completion of the hospital. Given the current state of completion, or should I say incompletion, with cladding being installed on an empty shell, is that an adequate amount to bring this project to completion? Or is it yet another thinly veiled attempt at duping the people of Euphoria into thinking that this government aims to complete the project? Just asking, Mr. Speaker, as gentle as I can, because the people of Viewfort and environments deserve to know, Mr. Speaker. That is why are we engage in all this absurdity. Hospital will open last year, at the end of the financial year. You just put in on cladding on the hospital. But there's more, Mr. Speaker. But you know, Mr. Speaker, and you can choose to believe me if you want. It's not for you to pass judgment on what you believe and don't believe. The startling thing is that presently, despite previously drawing attention to this, the ongoing construction does not have full approval since the other conditions of approval set by the DCA have not been met. And this was raised last year. To this day, the architectural certification has not been done. Under normal circumstances, the drawing should have never left the Office of the Development Control Authority unless all the conditions have been met. Up to now, Mr. Speaker, the mechanical and electrical drawings have not been submitted for approval to the DC. And you say you are completing a hospital, a public building of immense costs. Mind you, an ugly public building. And that seems to be the fate of Euphort South. The UWB has a habit of putting up ugly buildings in Euphort. I mean, they, they put some building in the airport there for rich people when they come, a private jet. The building is ugly. That's not even take into consideration the topography of the place. An ugly building. But you know, with private investment or not, I refuse to believe or accept that the DCA is not aware of what is going on as it pertains to the conditions it attached to the project. I will not accept that, Mr. Speaker. But you know, the deeper question is this. When these things happen, why should any citizen of this country obey the requirements of the Development Control Authority? They're all over the place harassing poor people. Should they obey them? For me, the more puzzling question is this. Why is it that the government of Taiwan continues to survive a project encased in pure lawlessness? Why is a foreign country doing this? But there's another matter that attracts my attention. It's the cladding, Mr. Speaker. And again, this is when now I ask my friend, the member for Castries Saudi, just a few questions that I, I need to have answers. Of course, this is a season when I have to feed answers to those who need them. Is it correct that a Trinidadian-owned company was contracted to provide the cladding 
and supervise its installation. Is that correct? What is the name of the company? Who is that company and what is its track record in procuring and installing cladding? Now, you know, you can tell me, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member can say from his seat where he's sitting there, no, no, it's not a Trent Island company. Matter closed. Matter closed. And what is the cost of installing the cladding? How much are you paying for it? Mr. Speaker, I keep on hearing a name, a gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Bash. Bash or Bash, B A K S H. I don't know, but it, it sounds eerily similar, but anyway, it may be just coincidence. Thank you, um, the member for Castries North. Um, but I think, in fairness, we need to know who the individual is, because obviously we all have an interest given what has occurred with cladding material in the United Kingdom, to, to, to get a good sense of who produced the cladding, where it's from, and precisely because it is a hospital, the safety issues underlying the cladding. Now, I accepted the invitation of the honorable members to come to the Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Home Affairs. Mr. Speaker, Part of the so-called new style presentation of the estimates is a section described as program performance information. That's one of the reasons why this book is so, so thick to mystify with all these. Now, I suspect we don't pay attention to it, Mr. Speaker. It is a confessional box. I call it a confessional box, where departments and ministries evaluate their performance. They set targets and they evaluate. I mean, I didn't check the Ministry of Tourism or Infrastructure. I'm certain other persons may want to do so. As I said, Mr. Speaker, truth is we hardly pay attention to this section of the estimates. But I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, they tell an interesting story. And it is worth looking at it because these are in the estimates of revenue and expenditure and available for discussion. Time does not allow me, because you've admonished me, to engage in any detailed analysis of the self-performance self of all the departments and ministries. But I will say this, the Department of Justice and the Department of Home Affairs and National Security attract me. Let's take a first look, look first, Mr. Speaker, the Department of Home Affairs and National Security, Mr. Speaker. Go to page 147, Mr. Speaker. Open your estimates, Mr. Speaker. Just look at page 147. And really, when we do these things, Mr. Speaker, um, it begs the question of the utility or the mechanism we use. I don't know where this came from. Mr. Speaker, I'm looking at key performance indicators, program performance information, um, Department of Home Affairs and National Security. Now, if you notice, Mr. Speaker, to the left, percentage of fire inspections and surveys attended to business places. Percentage of fire inspection surveys attended to non-business places. Percentage of special services responded to. Percentage of fire prevention seminars, training conducted, private, non-private institutions. Average response time to emergency calls. Percentage of emergency calls responded to. Percentage of fire investigations at business place. Percentage of fire investigations, non-business. Do you know, Mr. Speaker, the data is compiled for 2019 to 2020. 2021, 2021. 2020-21 revised estimates, 2021-2022. And you know, every indicator is 100%, even into the future. No, I mean, seriously, Mrs. Speaker, I want to urge, <laughs> I want to urge my serial colleagues to, to 147, to, to, to really be, take a serious look at this. And it'll become a little clearer. Now, if you don't believe me, Mr. Dave, let's take a look at page 150 to 1155, Mr. Speaker. Take a look at what, page 152, 152, and 155. Yeah, if you look at page 152, 155, and I assume they're talking about, yeah, they're talking about 
they are working, they are talking about inmates and so on. And look at the last percentage attendance in court by inmates. 2009 to 20, 100%. 2021, 100%. 2021, revised 100%. Budget estimates, 100%. 2023, 24, 100%. So we already, we know what the percentage is for the future. Now, percentage of recidivism. How you mean? 2019 20, and I'll tell you why. 45%, 45%, 45%, 45%, 45%. Percentage of mentally ill inmates receiving mental health care, 100%, 100%, But I find what is more interesting, Mr. Speaker, it's page 129, and I invite you, I, I know you will follow me, Mr. Speaker. I have no doubt, Mr. Speaker, you'll be amused by this. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker how much time I have left? Honorable Member, Member for Barbano, are you standing at a point of elucidation or standing order? Oh. Mr. Speaker, I'm standing oh, oh, because I realize the Member for Viewport South is Requesting more time? No, 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 no. So I'm standing I just wanted to find out. No, it's okay. I want to thank you. More time? You have to more time. And I appreciate the fact that you get, you're generous in your old age. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, how much time have I left? And he's my friend. We're going to have that exchange. Well, how much time I have left, Mr. Speaker? Ten minutes? <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have enough time. So, Mr. Speaker, let's take a look at a page 129. Now, have a look, Mr. Speaker, at page 129, and you'll understand. You'll understand what I'm getting at. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Justice, key program strategies for 2020-21, eh? Reestablish the forensic pathology service at the laboratory. And you remember the human cry, the condemnation. It says, achievement progress, column, the forensic pathology unit operations in the Solution Forensic Science Laboratory ceased in 2019. You read further. The forensic pathologist did not renew the contract for this financial year. We also did not hire another forensic pathologist since the intended candidate took up a teaching person, position and was unavailable to hire. And I can go on. But let's go on. Get trace unit online and commence training of analysts to perform casework trace analysis. Achievements, progress, to date this has not been achieved. Go down lower, Mr. Speaker. Absorb the crime scene unit under the umbrella of the forensic science services. This initiative was not realized. Tra go down lower. Train new evidence officer in justice tracks LIMS and, and to management of unit operations Achievement, this initiative was not realized. Bloodstain pattern analysis, trading and certification, this initiative was not realized. That's a trademark. Train, ex train expert witness testimony training course, this initiative will be held in December 2020. Gone by, eh? No, Mr. Speaker. When you look at the so-called key program strategies, there could be no greater indictment of a sitting minister than this, and you see why I was interested in it? But it is also a warning to all of you that you better pay attention to these things while in office. The fact is, the public officers in the Ministry of Justice have given their own minister a fail grade for his performance. That's the reality of it. They have judged him, and they told him, look, you have failed. And this is the same minister who had all the solutions for crime, whose advice he claims was not heeded by the previous administration. But what is the reality? He has presided over the worst homicide statistics in the island that's not reflected in this. Just look at the last four years of the respective administrations. 2013 on the labor, 34 homicides plus two police shootings. 2014, 34 homicides plus three police shootings. 2015, 29 homicides. 2016, 31 homicides. Total 128 over that period. 
enter the United Workers Party. 2017, no, not yet. 2017, 16 homicides. 60. And that is the highest number for any minister of national security we have ever appointed in this country. 2018, 43. 2019, 50. And 2020, 55, making a total, I believe, 208 homicides. Too numerous to count. Too numerous to count. But you know, honorable member, I will quote you. <laughs> and Mr. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you will note I have not named the minister. But I know you're an imaginative speaker, and you know exactly who I'm talking about. Suffice it to say, Mr. Speaker that this is the same minister who, probably, uh, who publicly asked me if I remember him. He was not even selected as a candidate, but he asked me if I remember him. My rep my reply, Mr. Speaker, truth is, I remember him very, very well. And I will remember him even better after this general election in May. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.